In those days, I mean during the era of King Louis Philippe, I made wooden shoes for a living. Our work team camped in the Gurunthuel mountain range on a slope leading into town. Surrounding us was a magnificent forest of beech trees which have since been turned into shoes. Between all of us cousins, as we were accustomed to call ourselves, we comprised a sort of village of five or six huts. Mine stood next to the ruins of an old chapel, and here I lived with my wife, God bless her, and our four children, who now are scattered about the world. The only sections of the chapel still standing are a portion of wall, a dilapidated altar overrun with brambles, and here and there the bases of columns buried beneath a thick layer of moss, weeds, and dead leaves. But towards the eastern side, and behind the altar was one great window, through which light fell on the choir, standing nearly intact at the end of the passageway, a frame for the old stones and ancient glass. Here, in the evenings after work, I loved to come and sit, peacefully on the edge of this stone sculpture, and smoke my pipe, and think, remote from the women's chatter and the gleeful noise of the children. There were nests of owls amongst the ruins, and late one afternoon, I don't remember how, as I was hoisting myself up to my usual seat, I startled one of these nocturnal creatures. As it fled its hole, it made such a strange sound that one might have mistaken it for someone moaning. The setting sun cast a sharp glare of winter light upon the ruins. Shocked and blinded by the dying crimson glow, the owl landed in my lap. I'd never seen one so close, only on barn doors where fearful peasants sometimes crucified them. Totally bewildered by its predicament, the owl tottered on the edge of my lap and would have pitched downwards from our lofty perch, but I grasped its wings, gently. I don't believe I'd ever held anything in my hands so soft and silky, so warm and trembling. I turned the bird away from the light to spare him the bright, stabbing glare of the setting sun. I looked into the owl's eyes, and they transfixed me. Have you ever studied the eyes of an owl? They are dim and yet like huge mirrors. You think you can see vaguely all sorts of mysterious things deep within. They are like the twin openings of a bottomless abyss, and seemingly many miles down into their depths one imagines one perceives great stirrings of shadows and light, undiscovered continents and oceans, processions of crowds and people who come and go like the speechless melancholy phantoms who people our dreams. Deeply. Deeply I gazed into the owl's eyes, but it studied me as well. Trembling even though its sad, compelling stare never wavered from my face. Who knows what thoughts troubled the frail creature? Did it fear that I, too, in fear, would nail it to the side of one of the surrounding beaches? In an effort to reassure the owl, and perhaps myself as well, I smoothed its feathers and said, Peace, peace, you poor beast. I am not a bad person. I do not wish to harm you. And it was true. We shoemakers live in the woods, in quiet solitude, amidst the sacred silence of nature. Though we wield axes and fell trees, we are serene souls who love birds, that keep us company as we work, singing to us, as if we were their guests, and they, our hosts, were anxious to soothe and entertain us in our toil. The owl does not sing, and does not show itself, but still I know the sound of its mournful melody in the depths of the night, and I sense it perching on the roof of my hut moving me towards solemn thoughts, remembering sometimes my long-dead ancestors who, according to legend, occasionally take the form of an owl in order to remind the living to respect those who are long past. For me, such thoughts are often in mind. The life hereafter preoccupies me more than life itself. I stroked the owl's russet, gray-tinged feathers and spoke my thoughts to it in a low, soothing voice, imagining that it might be as old as the beech trees along the path, that once the owl saw the chapel standing where now only stones cover the ground, that once it heard the bell summoning the people to saint's party. All the while that I spoke to it, the owl looked at me with its gray eyes, with their immobile pupils flecked with gold, pupils that seemed like stars against the blue velvet of the dark universe. Come, I said to myself aloud, let us return this poor blind creature to its rightful home. I pulled back the veil of hanging ivy which hid the nest from which the owl had tumbled forth, and as I did, I realized that the bird's home was not some chance cavity in the wall, but one of the compartments of an old cupboard, the kind one sees in churches to the right of the choir, and generally used for storing sacred vials. Two such vials were still there, one for wine, one for water, both covered with dirt and shrouded in layer upon layer of spider webs, which probably preserved them from the erosion of time. 
Next to the sacred vials lay a book. It was an enormous missile, very old and bound with metal clasps, stained with mold and corroded by humidity, but some of the gold edging still shone through. The sight of the book made me forget the frightened owl, who by then had taken refuge in a secluded corner of the cupboard. I was tempted by the missile. I knew a rather eccentric English gentleman in Belle Isle, who collected books of this type, paying their weight in gold, and even more when they were very old. Surely the missile no longer belonged to anyone. And yet as I hid it underneath my jacket, I felt curiously... evil. Or at least, greedy. I left my customary perch like a robber sneaking away from the scene of his crime, and as I did, the owl hooted mournfully, like a soul wailing the loss of salvation. Christmas was near. The night before the holiday, our camp leader asked me, Would you like to go to Belle Isle tonight? There's a shipment of shoes requested at Roll Even, the store on the Grand Rue. You'd be in time to attend midnight mass at the village church. I have always been a good Christian, but to my shame, I accepted enthusiastically, not because of the Midnight Mass, but because I would have had the opportunity to seek out my English friend and sell him the missile. Alone in my hut, I took the book from its hiding place, wrapped it in a piece of cloth, and slid it into the inside pocket of my jacket. After supper, with the cart load in my horse harness, I snapped the whip and began my journey. I was in high spirits. I have heard tales of travelers who set forth on Christmas Eve and met with ill luck. But nothing of the sort occurred to me. But there was the alluring promise of great profit at the end of my ride. The cold was biting. I wrapped myself in my coarse wool mantle, clamping the reins between my knees, my hands buried in my coat pockets. My horse was the most gentle and intelligent animal one could imagine. He understood the language of Brittany, as well as I or any of my cousins. All it took was one word for him to speed up his pace or slow down. He took the descending slope of the Gurenhuel at a trot. It was a clear night. A layer of hoarfrost powdered the countryside. The swaying of the cart rocked me gently, and I was lost in thought, speculating on the price the missile would bring. Wondering what gifts I should buy for my wife and children, I pictured in my mind's eye my loved one's surprise and joy when I brought them such presents as only rich children receive. And yet, the closer I got to Belle the less the prospect pleased me. An inarticulate anxiety began to nag at me, the kind of odd uneasiness one feels when seriously contemplating an action that one knows in one's heart to be wrong. A sudden sound startled me. Behind me, out of the chilly darkness of the night, I heard a prolonged moan, a plaintive murmur sad enough to melt the soul. I heard it again and yet again, and each time it was longer and more heavily laden with grief. I jerked erect, pushed my cover aside, grabbed the reins, and lashed out at my horse, who took off at full speed and plunged into the heart of the forest. Gigantic trees lined the path, their entangled barren branches woven into a ceiling shutting out the sky. On either side of the road, black tree trunks hemmed us in. Behind them were more trunks, thousands of bare trunks. I, who had always considered myself a child of the forest, born in its shadow, lulled in its ancient arms, nourished at its soft-scented breast, I, who had always lived in the woods and drew my sustenance from her noble body and blood, I, for the first time, was afraid. The large familiar beeches leaned over in a menacing manner I never knew before. Their branches seemed to reach out to pluck at me and stop my horse. The trees were a horde of mute ghosts glowering down with merciless intensity. And yes, they had eyes, every one of them. Look on each shaft at the top of the tallest branch, two pupils gleaming large and round, immobile, glaring with a pale, colorless light. My horse was just as frightened as I. He stopped abruptly in his tracks, his legs stiff, the hairs of his mane standing on end. Did I hear his heart beating wildly against his ribs, or was it mine, thundering as if it would burst? I shook so hard that I dropped the reins and was too terrified to think of setting foot outside the cart to pick them up. I sat in agonized expectation, icy drops of sweat trickling over me, my throat clutched tight with fear. God spare me from ever having to live through such unspeakable moments of dreadful anticipation again. And then a large shape wheeled away from one of the trees and hung in space a moment above the road before landing softly on the side of the cart. A snowflake could not have made less noise. I glanced into two bright eyes. I had mistaken for the eyes of the tree and an old formula came to mind, a charm a sorcerer once taught me to ward off the evil eye. White or black, I asked faintly. Good or evil? From God or the devil? Matthias, do you not recognize me? 
a weak, doleful voice asked. I am the owl from the ruins of St. Melar. You help me then, and now I shall save you. You think you are on the road to Belial, but I tell you that you are on the road to hell. There is an old legend which says that on the eve of our Savior's birth, dumb beasts are given the power of speech. Was this why the owl spoke to me, calling me by name? Or was he some long-dead forebear guiding me away from sin? And yet I told the bird I did no wrong, none that I know of. You have a weight beneath your arm. I blushed with shame. I robbed no one. An old book found in the ruins of a wall, is that such a great sin? Listen, Matthias, said the bird. Once there was a parish at saint Melar. A hundred years ago today, a priest celebrated the Midnight Mass. When he was done and the congregation dispersed to their homes, the priest was just taking off his ornaments, happy at the thought of a warm fire awaiting him in the presbytery, when a beggar woman appeared in the vestry, asking him to give her confession and communion. But the priest irritably replied, Return tomorrow morning, Brigada, for I will be here from nine on for confession, and you may take communion at the high mass. The old woman's eyes brimmed with tears, but not daring to insist, she bowed humbly and left. The next day at dawn, a road laborer found her wrapped in a shroud of snow, lying dead in a ditch. A terrible thing, I muttered, but what has it to do with me? Listen, Matthias, and you shall know. It was the priest's fault that she did not die in a state of grace. In time it came his turn to appear before the throne of God, and God said for the sin that you committed, as long as there are two stones remaining of the chapel at saint Melar, you shall provide communion on Christmas Eve to all lost souls. The wind sighed sadly through the beaches like a choir of specters seeking the words of some long-forgotten hymn, and still the owl spoke to me in his low, quavering murmur. Here is Christmas Eve, Matthias. Soon the midnight bells will ring. That priest is at his post. The company of the damned assembled, the sacred vials soon to be filled, but the great missile, the book, Matthias, is missing. The priest will not be able to perform the service, and who knows, perhaps he will have to begin his hundred years of penance all over again. But you, who stole the missile, you, Matthias Carveno, are in a far greater danger. That which belongs to the dead becomes an instrument of hellfire in the hands of the living. With trembling fingers, I took the book from my pocket. Here it is, I muttered. I return it to you. I am only an owl and cannot carry so heavy a burden. You must take it back to where you found it. I hope it is to my everlasting credit that I did not hesitate even for a moment. I immediately got out of the cart, retrieved the reins, clambered back in, and invited my horse to retrace our steps. No longer were the trees terrifying specters, for now I knew them again, the friendly assortment of elms and beeches, chestnuts and oaks, whose majesty protected and nurtured me all my life. Once more, the night had the divine calm of the holy time to come, and in my heart, too, there was gentle peace abiding. When we reached the neighborhood of our camp, I tethered my horse to a gatepost and entered the ruins. As I did, I heard a great fluttering behind me, and turning, saw that there was a huge flock of owls perched on the surrounding branches, staring down at me with eyes so filled with misery that I felt no fear, but only an immeasurable pity. I returned the missile to its old home, made the sign of the cross as I passed in front of the altar and returned to my cart. I got back in and took the reins, ready to begin my journey anew, but just then I heard voices arising from the depths of the destroyed chapel, wan voices singing praises to the Son of God. I looked back but no longer saw the owls. Kneeling in the ruins of the sanctuary was a crowd of people intoning a nativity hymn while a priest with white hair extended his arms, and an acolyte brought him a great, gilt-edged, open missile. I flecked the reins, and my horse took off in a gallop in the direction of Belle-Ile. The bells of the Gurnwell district, of Plongauvert, of Logunel, and twenty more parishes pealed forth in the milky brightness of the night beneath the sparkling stars. I arrived at Belle-Ile just in time to enter the church that was lit with as many lights as a cathedral. And there, I attended Mass. Mm -hmm.